Anyway, uh, a, it's about a priest and a pastor and a rabbi. And they were all sitting around talking. They're bragging about who does their job the best. And so the pastor says, I got an idea. We can solve this. Let's go out in the woods and each of us try and convert a wild bear. And whoever does the best with the bear wins. So they agree to it and they, you know, they all go out in the woods, each of them, and they get together later to compare notes. And the priest says, okay, I found a bear. And he, I started reading him from the catechism. And uh, then I sprinkled him with holy water. And uh, next week is his first communion, so obviously I'm the best. Pastor says, <laughs> that's nothing. Pastor says, I found a bear by the stream. I preached an hour-long sermon to him. He started weeping, and uh, then he stood up and got saved right on the spot. I laid hands on him, he got slain in the spirit, and he joined the church. Let's see, anybody beat that. And then they both looked over at the rabbi, and they noticed his clothes were all torn to shreds. He's bruised and bloody and beaten. And uh, they said, what in the world happened to you? And the rabbi just shook his head, and he said, well, in retrospect... I probably shouldn't have started with circumcision. <laughs> oh my goodness is right. Join hands with somebody. And, uh, yeah, I know you're thinking, did he really just say that? Yeah. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for For your word, thank you for, wow, the anointing that's on the word. Thank you for your presence in this house today. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just descend and just light upon each one. Shine your light upon us. Open your word to us. Touch our hearts. Change us. Challenge us today. We'll give you all the glory and all the praise, Lord Jesus. Because it's in your name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. 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 All right, today I want to talk to you about a vision of heaven and hell. Let's read a couple of scriptures. And Matthew, are you ready? Yes, sir. And let's put up 1 Peter uh, 1, 3 and 4. And uh, go ahead. Blessed, gratefully praised and adored be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant and boundless mercy has caused us to be born again. That is, to be reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose to an ever-living hope and confident assurance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hang on a second. Let's reread that part. To an, to an ever-living what? Hope, hope and hope. confident assurance. Confident assurance. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'll go ahead and finish the passage. Born, born anew into an inheritance which is imperishable beyond the reach of change, and undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven for you. You know, if Jesus had not raised from the dead, we wouldn't be sitting here. You realize that? Because everything that he preached and everything that he did would have been a fallacy, because it's all based on the presupposition that he was not just any person. He was the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Divine. Without sin. How many of you know Jesus Christ was without sin? And when he died for us, his, his blood that was shed was effective for the cleansing of all sin of everyone who's ever lived, everyone who's alive today, and everyone who will yet live in the future. Amen? So that was an incredibly powerful, the death, the burial, and resurrection. It's a line of demarcation in human history. Our calendar is based upon that. Every, and, and it's incredible, the proliferation of Christianity since the birth of this, this man who was God in the flesh. The life that he lived in just 33 and a half years. The, the great event of his crucifixion, his burial, him raising from the dead. That is, that is the point of change in human history. It's the change in, of every uh, person who is a seeker. Because now we live under the age of grace. Nobody's getting stoned today. Guess what? If I make a mistake preaching, I'm not going to be stoned today. Isn't that great? Yeah. wasn't so before Christ. Amen? 
Everything changed because of Jesus Christ and because of his resurrection, which proved him to be the Son of God. Now read the next one, Matt. Revelation 1, 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So Jesus is not only author of salvation, as we saw in the first scripture that Matthew read, but now we see he also has the keys of what? Hell. And the, the keys of hell and death. What are keys, by the way? What do they do? They lock doors. What do they represent? Authority, yes. I have the key. You don't all have the key to my house. I hope none of you have the key to my house. Because I know some of you. Yeah, you'll be in there eating out of my refrigerator, okay? I'm the only one that has the key to my house because I have the authority. I own the, the home. If you own your own home, you have the key, okay? So Jesus has authority over heaven, but he also holds the keys of hell and of death. Now, I'm kind of amazed, really. The only thing that was on my heart all week to speak about on Easter Sunday was this, heaven and hell. And the accent is going to be on hell today. And I don't know why. I, I, you know, the Lord often gives me unusual or difficult assignments. Those of you that know me, you kind of, you know, Sue Carr kind of knows this. Danny knows this. Uh, you know, I rush in where angels fear to tread. You know, and the Lord just, I mean, I'm either very brave or very stupid. Or a little bit of both, actually, and I think that's probably the reality. But I want to talk a little bit about hell with you this morning. Let's look at Isaiah 66. And I have it in two translations. I'd like you to read them both back to back. First, the New Living Testament. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For the worms that devour them will never die. And the fire that burns them will never go out. All who pass by will view them with utter horror. Okay, go ahead and read the Amplified Version. Then they will go forth and look upon the dead bodies of the rebellious men who have transgressed against me. For their worm, maggot, will not die. And their fire will not go out. And they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. There's literally going to be a place. I believe it's going to be on the new earth. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to roll up the old heavens and the old earth like a scroll and create a new heavens and a new earth. And I think a lot of us at some juncture, we're going to be on the new earth. We're not going to be, I know you've seen depictions of people that are dead and they're like, they've got angel outfits on and halos and they're sitting on a cloud playing the harp, floating through, you know. That's not going to be what eternity is. We're going to be going places. We're going to be doing things with God and for God. And that's why how you live your life here is going to determine how much of responsibility and authority you're given in the next life. There are rewards, the Bible says, for deeds done in the body. Salvation is a free gift, but what you do with your life, especially after that, there's going to be rewards. There's going to be um, a bestowal of authority in different parts. And so there's going to be a place where the redeemed of the Lord are going to be able to actually go and look down and see the torment, the agony. And it says that the worm that devours them will never die. That's a horrifying thought, isn't it? It says in uh, the Amplified, it calls the worm maggots. That's never going to die. And there's, a, there's going to be uh, everlasting torment for those that don't know Christ. If you're watching on the internet right now or through recording later on, I just want you to know this is serious, serious business. There is a reason we preach the gospel. Gospel means good news. And the good news for you today is you don't have to sit there in your home and wait to spend an eternity separated from God in eternal torment. Jesus purchased the way for you. He said, I am the way. The truth, the life, as in the one and only. He is the way. But if you receive Christ, everything can change for you today. Really pray that it does. I really pray you take this seriously. And so, let's read the next, uh, Matthew, Mark chapter 9. Read that, please. 
But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe and trust in me to stumble, that is, to sin or lose faith, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone, one requiring a donkey's strength to turn it, were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble and sin, cut it off. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than to have two hands that go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not put out. If your foot causes you to stumble and sin, cut it off. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. It would be better for you to enter the life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not put out. If your eye causes you to stumble and sin, throw it out. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. It will be better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm that feeds on the dead does not die and the fire is not put out. Amen. That's the word of God, folks. Amen. I didn't write it, but it's there for all to read. Now, your name is... Pardon me? Josh, it's good to see you, Josh. God bless you. Are you the one that received Christ this week, or was it your brother? What, Ryan was his name? Yeah, that's awesome. I hope he comes here. I'd love, love to see him and meet him. Uh, you've gotten saved recently? Have you? No? Well, today's your day. Isn't that great? Yeah, at the end of the service, you're going to receive Christ. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Glory to God. Yeah. Amen. And someone else may be joining you. You just never know. Um, and your brother uh, did the best thing. He made the best decision anybody could ever make. And all of your family here, has, are, you know, God's really moving through your family. I, uh, I went away some years ago. I went away for some prayer and fasting. I went to a cabin in the woods and spent a few days out there. And uh, actually, I've done that more than once. But in this particular instance, I was praying. And I was walking across the living room. I was kind of pacing and talking to the Lord. I spent three days just talking to the Lord. And all of a sudden, the power of God hit me so strongly, I just buckled. I just fell right to my knees. And the Lord, at that point, gave me an open vision. It was one of the first ones I, I had ever had. And in this particular vision, uh, I saw a man, and uh, he was suffering. Now, let me tell you, it was someone that I actually knew. I had met him. His wife had started coming to church, and uh, she became a Christian. She received the Lord, and we had been praying for this man. His name was Rick. And uh, my wife and I got together with the two of them and had dinner, and I just started witnessing to this gentleman. I knew he had some issues. He was a very nice guy, very friendly, and got to know him a little bit, and just it was kind of lifestyle evangelism. And so uh, we prayed for him, and, uh, and then I went away. And I'd known him for a few months at that point. And uh, then I had this vision, and there he was. And he was laying uh, on the ground, and there was flames all around him. And I looked more closely at his face. And uh, there's no children in here, right? No kids? Okay. And uh, what I saw was horrif horrifying. Uh, there was maggots um, going in and out of the orifices of his head, yeah, his nostrils, his mouth, his eyes. The eyes, the eyes had been eaten out of the sockets, the ears, and they were just crawling all over him and inside of his face, and he was writhing in torment. Is one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen. There's no horror movie or whatever Hollywood can do with CGI that can compare to what I saw in that moment. And I knew what maggots looked like because I remember a little while before that we had gotten maggots in one of our trash cans. And I opened the can to put a bag in. The smell was horrendous. And I kind of saw what they are. You know what maggots are? They're like uh, the larvae of flies, right? They later turn into flies, and flies are disgusting. And uh, the smell was horrendous. And so there, there were these little worms that were, I don't know, like beige in color, you know. 
And, uh, and so when I saw this vision, I knew immediately what it was. And the Lord spoke to me then, and he said, uh, this is why I want you to preach the gospel. This is why. And he chose to show me it was somebody I knew, someone I had started to care about. I'm sure he had a purpose in that. And so, you know, I'm a scriptural person. And I said, Lord, can you scripture me? Is this really what awaits people who don't know Jesus? And the Lord took me to these scriptures that you just read. And I was amazed because I had seen what was absolutely was maggots. When I went to the Bible, I found out that the worm that never dies, it's actually called maggots. Can you imagine how horrifying an eternity without God would be? This is why Jesus died, you know. We've all seen the passion of the Christ in other movies uh, depicting the resurrection. We've seen the horror, and if you've seen the passion of the Christ, let me tell you, you cannot watch that movie without being changed by it. I cried, and my wife will tell you, we both cried. I think it was at least three hours nonstop weeping because it was like watching my best friend be tortured for two hours on the big screen. Someone that I love more than anybody. I care about watching. The, it was a very accurate depiction as well. They studied. They did the most accurate depiction ever. He would not have gone through that if there wasn't something really serious about it. And we love to talk about heaven and paradise and what awaits us and all the great things. And that's part of the reason was to get us there, but the other part was to get us away from what was awaiting us apart from him, which is this. People say, oh, I'm going to be, you know, a lot of unsaved people, I've heard them say, atheists, ah, well, if there is a hell, I'll be playing cards with my friends. No, no, no. You're going to be alone. You're going to be isolated. You're going to be uh, separated. The only thing you're going to hear is screams of other people who are going through what you're going through. And so the Lord took me to these passages, and I read them. And I just prayed more fervently for this man. You know, people ask, why do people receive Christ so much at your church? We just tell you, it's because we care. It's because we care. I've preached all over the country, some of you know, for 10 years. I was everywhere, from coast to coast, even in some foreign countries. And the thing that I discovered is that there, in many churches, there's really, truly a lack of concern for the lost. Truly. I know a lot of pastors, they don't leave one person to the Lord in a year, in a calendar year. Don't witness. Don't really care. Say they care. But here's the thing. You know, if you really believe something, words are cheap. Your actions show what you really care about. Isn't that correct? There's people that could have been at church today. They're not in church all over the world. And they'll make a lot of excuses. Oh, I had an ear ache or I had a little hangnail or whatever. The excuse. Oh, I was really tired, but... The real thing is that what you care about, that's what you do. If you really care about God, if you love him, if you come to a place where you love him, then you want to follow his commands. You're going to be in church. You're going to be in fellowship with other believers because that's what he said to do. He paid the price for that. So you could have the liberty and the freedom to do that. Some months later... I was at work. I was working a side job at the time to make a little extra money for the family. I was pastoring. Uh, I was a very young pastor at the time. It was like 1989, 1990, somewhere in there. And all of a sudden, I was working on a Saturday. All of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me about this guy. And while I was at work, the Holy Spirit said to me, Call him now. Call him now. Okay, so I just picked up the phone, gave him a call, and he answered the phone, and he was amazed. And he said, I can't believe you're calling me. 
right now. I said, why is that? He said, I was just about to kill myself. He said, my business failed. It was my dad's business. I ran it into the ground. I'm addicted to drugs and alcohol. I can't stop. I'm a chain smoker. I'm a nervous wreck. He had two kids, wife who loved him. She'd been praying for him. I said, do not do anything. I'll be right there. I got permission from uh, the boss there to leave an hour early. Went straight to his home. And he was shaken like a leaf in his living room. And I had preached the gospel to him before. And I said, Rick, this is going to go one of two ways. You're going to be either a friend of God or you're going to be dead by sundown. I'm here to make sure that the latter doesn't happen. And so he was just, he was trembling. And he was, there was such warfare in that living room. I mean, there were, you could feel evil spirits that were just trying to keep him from receiving Christ. And so what happened next was, uh, I looked at his wife, and she, I could see she, and she was a real prayer warrior. And I could see she understood that there was warfare. So she excused herself and went into the bedroom, and I knew exactly why. Why do you think she went into the bedroom? To start praying. And you could feel, as she was praying back there, just almost visibly the room became lighter. The prayers of his wife were just pushing back evil and opening the door. Instead of all this turmoil and warfare, he finally says, he leans back in his, on his couch and he says, that's it, I give up, I surrender. I want God. I want God. And I didn't even ask him to do this. He just went right to his knees in the middle of his living room. And he asked Jesus to come into his heart with such passion. He was in such pain emotionally. And as he did, I could just feel like the burdens starting to lift off of him. And then you know what he did next? And a lot of people don't do this. And if you're still struggling with addiction, you might want to consider this. He renounced drugs. He renounced alcohol. He even renounced cigarette smoking. He never touched a cigarette after that day, let alone another drug or any booze. He did nothing. God delivered him from all of it without any, uh, what do you call it, uh, withdrawals. Without any withdrawal. God delivered him immediately because of the cry of his heart. And then, and he just, man, he got up off the floor and changed, man. His countenance was different. His face had softened. He looked 10 years younger. Before he got saved, he looked, he looked like he was way older than he was. Then he goes, uh, he goes somewhere. He get, got out everything he was hiding from his wife. The drugs. Even his cigarettes. And he went and he threw it all away. He flushed the drugs down the toilet. Got rid of everything. Amazing. And you know what happened to this guy after that? He planted himself in the house of God. When the doors were open, he was in church. And within a year, the guy's leading, he was leading a Bible study in his home. He was a completely different person. Joyful and happy and, you know, that can happen for anybody. I sense in my heart there's people watching today on live streaming. And you're saying to yourself, you said to yourself, I need that. I want that. I'm tired of the way I've been living. There's Christians watching. You have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And you know what the Bible says about you? You are of all men most miserable. Because you're, you're half in and half out. Stop compromising. Run up the white flag. Just surrender to Jesus. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. You really think you're going to win? You really think you're going to be able to do this thing your way and be happy or successful or have any joy or peace? 
It's not going to happen because he is our peace. He is our joy. He's your God and he loves you. He's reaching out to you right now. He's reaching out to every one of our hearts this morning. I have another scripture. Matt, would you read Ezekiel 3, please? Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you will certainly die, and you do not warn him or speak out to tell him to turn from his wicked way to save his life, that same evil man will die in his sin, but you will be responsible for his blood. However, if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he will die in his sin. But you have freed yourself from responsibility. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness, right standing with God, and sins, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he will die in his sin, and the righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered but you will be responsible for his blood. However, if you have warned the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning. Also, you have freed yourself from responsibility. I love to preach the good news, the gospel. And there is a little bit of a selfish reason there. Because, I, you know, if I've been faithful to share the good news with people, at the end of the day, and I'll, listen, I'll pray for you like crazy. I will turn heaven and earth upside down to see someone come to Christ. But if in the end they remain rebellious and they choose to be rebellious against the Lord, I will shed a tear and I'll go on to someone who's really hungry for God. And I, I'm freed from responsibility. I sleep better knowing that at least I did everything I could to bring that person to Christ. Amen? And I hope that you kind of catch that vision. You know, you don't have to be the most eloquent person in the world. But, man, just invite them to church. Invite that waiter or waitress to church. Invite that neighbor. Invite your brother. It's your brother. It's your sister, for goodness sakes. Invite them. Understanding what awaits those who rebel. Understanding what awaits those who love God. I mean, this is, you know, paradise. Heaven. Eternity with Christ. We know exactly what heaven's going to look like, what it's going to be, but it's going to be pretty snazzy, let me tell you, if God made it for us. And so this, I feel a responsibility. Now, a lot of churches have gospel meetings, you know. I think, uh, Pastor Lee, in the, didn't like in the 50s and 60s, was it common for churches to have like Sunday night services that were designed like invite unsaved people and so forth? Yeah. And we, I've done that in the past as well. I'm certainly open to returning to that. But I discovered something years ago. Is that you can preach and teach the church. You can establish disciples. And guess what? If you just care, care enough at the end of the service to invite. You can, I could teach on anything. I could teach on racism or abortion. I could teach on prayer. or you know. But at the end of that service, Mark... It's good, isn't it, to just say, you need to be saved. Who wants... Uh, is Susie, remember Susie, years ago I talked about it in a sermon, I talked about just asking people. Remember that? I said a reason a lot of people don't get saved or they don't even come to church is simply because Christians don't ask them. You don't have to learn a nifty gospel presentation just like what Jesus said at the woman of the well, he said, just go and tell people what the Lord's done for you. Just tell somebody what God's done for you, how he's changed your life. Well, I'm a Christian. Boy, it really changed me. You want to come to church? If you can do that much, you've given someone an opportunity, and then you're freed from responsibility, like it says in this. And so Susie, who just takes whatever's preached and goes out and lives it, what did you do, Sue? Do you remember? Yeah, that very week, right? And what did they say? Isn't that simple? Walt, you've been in sales for years. You, you know, because I worked with you, it's a numbers game. 
If you don't ask anybody, if you don't try and close the sale, you're not going to make any sales, right? But if you ask and ask and ask, there's, there's going to be a percentage of people that are going to say, yeah, I want to buy that office furniture or whatever it is you're selling at the time. Christianity is all about where a person is in their heart and in their lives. And if you ask them if they're in that place, and they, they may be in that place where they're ready, but if we don't ask, we won't know. And this scripture, it sounds a little harsh, but it says, their blood is on your hands. It's a pretty serious Easter Sunday, isn't it? But guess what? I speak truth today. I'm speaking truth to you. This is eternity. And listen, the moment a person dies, they find out how real all of what I'm saying, all of this is, what we've read, what we've preached today. The moment you go into eternity, you find out, oh my, this is true. I listened to a testimony last night of a man. He preaches all over the world now, but he was an avowed atheist. He was a diver. And he was diving, and he was trying, he was gathering lobsters, you know, make a living, lobsters and cra crabs and whatever. And all of a sudden, he got stung by, you know, anybody know what a, a, a jellyfish is? And this, any, anybody ever been stung by a jellyfish? I guess one of the worst or the worst kind is called a box jellyfish. He got stung by, and they, one sting can kill you from these guys. He got stung not once, but by five jelly, bo five box jellyfish. Yeah. And he was rushed to the hospital, and uh, he actually died. They kept telling him, keep your eyes open, because if you, if you close your eyes, you're gone. And he, you know, but once he, as soon as he got to the hospital, he couldn't keep his eyes open anymore. He just felt the life ebbing out of him. And he immediately went to hell. And he saw, and I'm, going to give you, I'm not going to give you the whole depiction, but I've heard a number of people talk about how they went to hell. And then they were brought back on the operating table or whatever, with the paddles or whatever. And then, God took him to heaven and showed him heaven. And then, boom, I think they did the paddles and life came back in his body and, he, and he was a, he's been a changed man ever since. The stark difference. And listen, I have personally talked to people who have died for a few moments and experienced that. I've heard their depictions. And I've, I've seen many, many more on film. And let me just tell you something. Never in all the years I've known the Lord, since it's been 44 years now, I've never heard one person who was a Christian who died and actually got to experience heaven, never one of them said that they wanted to come back. Once you get to that place, it's so awesome, you don't want to come back. But for those that went to hell, my gosh, there was one time uh, in the same week, I talked to a person who was a Christian who had died and was brought back and a couple of days later, I visited uh, the grandfather of our neighbor, who they asked me to visit. And he was not a Christian. He had lived his life in sin. He'd had a major stroke. Could not speak. As soon as I saw the man, I knew, this guy has seen hell. They brought him back, and because the look on his face was horror. It was his eyes were saying, save me. Don't let this happen to me. What I did was I preached the gospel. Let me tell you something. Even if someone's in a coma, you can preach the gospel to them. Because this, your spirit never sleeps. The spirit inside of you, where the Holy Spirit dwells, it never slumbers or sleeps. And so, if you're talking to someone in a coma, preach the gospel to them. I've heard of people, I've seen people, that the God, they're in comas and gospels preach to them and tear rolls down their face. They hear you. Their spirit hears you. I believe they have the power to even receive the Lord, in, even in a comatose state, because it's their spirit. Can you, are you hearing me now? You hear? 
I visited a nursing home once, and I saw um, a catatonic lady. You know what catatonic means? You're totally unresponsive. And I looked at her, and she, her face, I'm going to try and imitate this. She, it was like she was slumped over like this, and she was like, mouth is open, eyes are open. like. And the nurses would talk to her, you would talk, no response. I don't understand what causes people to go into that state. I know it's real. I saw the movie Awakenings years ago. You see that movie with Robin Williams, Robert De Niro, about people that were comatose. It's a true story. They were, excuse me, they were in a catatonic state, and he developed a drug, brought them out. The sad thing was they found out the drug was temporary. So they became alive again, started talking and doing things, and then slowly they went back into their... To me, that's like people who are saved and they backslide. I watch them fall back into what they used to be because they don't pursue God at all. They just want a freebie. Well, I went to talk to this woman, and uh, I had no response, you know. I, so I thought, man, I need to preach the gospel to her. So I preached the gospel to her, and I laid hands on her, and I began to pray. And I just prayed, God, help this woman touch her heart. And then I started to pray in the Spirit. I prayed in tongues over her. I tell you, there is a power in praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. There's a power. I've seen it so many times, how it just changes everything. And in this particular instance, I laid hand, I'm talking, praying in English. Then I shifted to praying in tongues, but I was praying so quietly no one could hear me. Under my, you know how you talk under your breath? You know, like wives, when you're mad at your husbands, you just kind of go, oh, tah, tah. <laughs> that kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. Goldie, I've seen you do it in church. You know, I know. No, totally. <laughs> so I was praying in tongues over her like that because I didn't want to freak anybody out, the nurses and the staff that was there. You know, we were there ministering to a whole group of people in the psychiatric unit, Okay. So there's all these people around, the nurses, etc. So I just prayed under my breath. As soon as I started praying in other tongues, she starts going like this. Uh, sounded like an engine being revved, you know. Like and praying in tongues is like putting on the gas pedal. Uh, you know, it's it kind of scary sounding. And I took my hand off her. Ooh, what did I do? And one of the guys, the guitar player that I had brought with me, because we did a whole service for him, he's looking at me like, what the heck? And then, you know, I'm kind of ordinary, so I thought, I'm going to try that again. <laughs> Threw my hand on her, started praying in English. Nothing. And I started praying in tongues. <laughs> and I took my hand off her and just to see what would happen, and she stopped. I stopped praying, she stopped. Guess what I did then? I had to do it one more time. <laughs> I just had to. So I'm like, there she goes. English, nothing, tongues. Ugh. I'm telling you, there's power. There is a reason for it. If it's in the Bible, there's a reason for it. And if it's, and if it's in the Bible and, it's, and we're told it's a good thing, we should desire it and pursue it. I'm telling you, it's for everybody. Well, what about the... No, no, no. There's a scripture. Let me. Uh, I'm going to cut the. There is a gift of tongues that's given publicly for interpretation. And not everybody does it. But then there's a private, personal prayer language that anyone can have. Everybody in the Bible got prayed for got you know, something supernatural. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Where did he do that? At home. Privately. So, then the Lord spoke to me after the third time, and he said, she sold her soul to the devil. She was a witch. She looked like one. Her hair was scraggly, and just she just looked like a witch. And so, now this woman, unresponsive, other than, uh, I bowed really low, and I got right face to face with her. And I said, the Holy Spirit just told me that you told me you're a witch. You sold your soul to the devil. Is that true? And all of a sudden, this was creepy, man. 
She's going from like this, and then I'm standing right here, and she goes like this. She looks at me like this. And you don't want to receive Christ. You don't want to repent of your sins and change your destiny. And she goes, and then she just went right, just like this. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. She just goes right back into her catatonic state. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't know what went before in this woman's case, but I'm going to tell you, that was spooky. That was creepy. I, I don't believe it's too late for anybody. I really don't. The thief on the cross, I don't, it wasn't too late for him. I don't know. Let's finish up, Matt. Luke 23. One of the criminals who had been hanged on a cross beside him kept hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us from death. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are suffering justly because we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. When, when did he say the man was going to be with? Today. today. Listen, don't, let, don't listen to anybody. I don't care if it's a preacher. There's just a lot of idiots out there. They troll the internet. They're everywhere, man. And there's people that say, well, you know, you're going to stay in your graves for however many, however long it is. And No, no, no. There's no spirit. Let me... You can visit the cemetery. There's nobody whose spirit is in that casket. All that's in the casket is the remains of the shell that they walked around in, however long they were on the earth. Jesus said, today you'll be with me. When, if you are absent from the body, and the Apostle Paul wrote this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment we leave this life, if you're a Christian, you're with Jesus, period. Boom, just that quickly. And just the word says it, the testimony of thousands of people who have actually died, they were immediately with Jesus. They're, yeah, right away. There's no holding station, folks, okay? And so, man, thank God for that. Aren't you glad about that? And read the last scripture, Matt. So if you believe deep in your heart that God raised Jesus from the pit of death, and if you voice your allegiance by confessing the truth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. Okay, there's two components to salvation. Danny said it Wednesday night. If you believe in your heart, okay, that God raised Jesus from the dead, there's got to be a thing in the heart, but that's not enough. What's the other factor? You have to confess with your voice. You have to voice your allegiance. Confessing the truth that what? Jesus is what? Lord. Say it again. Jesus is... Lord. What does Lord mean? Anybody know? He's the master. He's the boss. This is his program. A lot of people say, well, uh, God is this or God is that. I believe, I believe. I, I don't give a tutti fruity what you believe. <laughs> if you believe anything other than what the author of salvation says, you're an idiot. I don't care. You can hold hands around a tree in your backyard and worship Mother Nature. You are a capital F fool. You're a dummy. You know, for, I mean, pick up a book. Let's pick up somebody's autobiography. I don't believe that's what's happened. I don't believe it. What do you know? It's their, auto, it's their thing, man. You've got to believe what they say because they lived it, okay? God is God, man. You don't have enough under the hood to challenge God. What he says goes, period. If he says, don't forsake the assembling with other Christians, you, and you don't listen to him, you're a fool. I just say that in ultimate love, but you are a fool, and I just love you enough to tell you the truth. God, if God says this is what you need to do to be saved, that's what you do. Why? Because he's the boss. If he says you need my word and you need prayer to grow, that's what you do. It works. 
And if he says you need fellowship and you need support from other believers to live a Christian life, that is what you do. You do anything else, it's completely reckless and foolhardy. Why would you challenge the one who created everything? My thing, and I remember this when we were young. Dave, you probably remember this. There's a saying going around our church way back. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God said it, I believe it, and the matter is settled. Life is too hard to work up your own plan for salvation. Let me tell you. And it's so simple. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Go ahead, Matthew, read the rest of this passage. Belief begins in the heart and leads to a life that's right with God. Confession yeah. departs from our lips and brings eternal salvation. Yeah. Because what Isaiah said was true. The one who trusts in him will not be disgraced. Remember that the Lord draws no distinction between Jew and non-Jew. He is Lord over all things, and he pours out his treasures on all who invoke his name. Because the scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Doesn't, aren't you glad it doesn't say some who call on the name of the Lord will be saved? It says who? Everyone. Is, are you part of everyone? I am too. Absolutely. I called on his name back in 1974, and guess what? He honored his word. He came into my heart. He saved me. He changed me. Changed me so much. Everything in my life was different. Because I didn't just say it with my lips, I believed it in my heart. You've got to have both of these things. You've got to believe it in your heart and confess it. Why do you have to confess it publicly? Why? Anybody want to answer that? Yeah, you believe what you speak? No, Jesus said that if you confess me in front of men, I'll confess you in front of my father. Ooh, he's just scriptured me. Did you see that? And if you deny me in front of men, I'll deny you in front of my father. Say it again. If you confess me in front of men, I will confess you in front of my father. I'll confess you in front of my father. What, then, but if you deny me in front of men, I will yes. deny you in front of my father. Yeah. Well, I'm not denying him, Pastor Mike. Well, you're not confessing him either. Why are you afraid to confess him? Yeah. If he hung naked on a cross for you, he suffered all that humiliation and the pain and the torture of the crucifixion, the crown of thorns, the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet, the scourging, just the scourging alone. My gosh. If he did all that for you publicly, he hung on that cross for three hours in front of all for everyone to see. Why wouldn't you want to confess him? Now, the same night that I confessed the Lord and I received Christ, my cousin prayed the same words. For him, though, it was just lip service. He never went on, not one. He never grew one inch in God. He lived, I don't know what he's doing now because he lives in another state, but. Yeah, my cousin and I went two different directions that night. You have to have the confession of lips, but also there's a heart issue too. You have to believe in your heart. If you believe that he is the Christ, that he has risen from the dead, you're going to get saved. Amen. So this is your time now. Would you like to receive Christ? What's that? Oh, it's up to you, brother. Yeah. Anybody else? Does everybody else here know Jesus? If you don't, just raise your hand because we're going to just say a little prayer here and settle it right now. Okay. If you're watching right now on the internet, this is your moment. This is your time. Praise the Lord. And now, what do you tell me what you're feeling? I'm just curious. Let's we'll say that again. More wholeheartedly. So you, this is your first time here, or what? Been here before? Okay. I'm going to say this one thing, and then I won't bug you, but the night I got saved, I said to the person who was leading me to Christ, I said this, I said, well, I don't think I'm ready. I swear. I don't think I'm ready. 
So I think I need to just clean up a few things. I said almost the same thing that you did. I didn't feel wholeheartedly. And he said this to me, and I don't know if this will make a difference for you. This is what he said to me, and he later became my pastor. He wasn't pastoring then. I had no idea that he even had that capacity. He just said, Mike, let me tell you something. You may not feel that you're ready, but Jesus is. And those things that you want to clean up inside your heart, inside your life, he doesn't want you to do that by yourself. If you invite him in, the best way you know how, he'll come in and he'll help you clean up your life. You won't have to do it on your own. And I thought, for a minute, I thought, that, that makes sense. I can see that. He doesn't want me to be perfect to receive him. He doesn't, I don't have to change anything to receive him. I just have to simply receive him. It's just acknowledge I'm a sinner. So I did that. But there was one other thing that happened that night. This is for everybody here. There was a huge warfare, just the same as there was with my friend Rick. There was a huge warfare in that kitchen that January night, 1974. My cousin just glibly just, you know, right, and, but for me, I couldn't pray it. it what, I wanted to, but when it was time to say, I invite you into my heart, I couldn't talk, man. My lips, I felt like my tongue got really tied up and my lips were, I just couldn't even move my lips. And he was wise enough that he just paused for a few seconds. You should all be praying now, by the way, in the spirit. And um, he said it again. Jesus, come into my heart. We had prayed up to that point and got to that place, and I still couldn't say it. I started, what's your first name again? Josh. I started breaking out in a cold sweat, man. Why is that? I was a really cool, you know, I was a cool dude. I was a cool as a cucumber in school and all that. I was just, you know, could handle anything. But this, I couldn't handle the intense heat. And then he paused. He just waited. And the thing that he did was, I thought was, I'm really grateful for to this day, Josh, was that he, um, he didn't say, oh, it's okay. Just don't worry about it. We'll do it later or whatever. He didn't. He just waited and he did it the third time. Jesus come into my heart. And at that point, and you know what, his wife was praying. And his daughter was praying quietly. And they were all around the kitchen table as this was happening. And something in my heart's like, okay, all right. All I have to do is just run up the white flag here. Just surrender to God. Because I know he's gonna he's gonna get me one sooner or later, you know. He doesn't get tired, man. You know, it's like we're jogging. <sighs> We've gone a mile. <sighs> we turn around, and there's Jesus, and he's like... <laughs> you know, people spend their whole lives just weary, and, and the Lord's just right there. I'm just going to do what my first pastor did and say, you don't have to... Ch- change anything and clean up anything you just have to open your heart and just sincerely invite him in and then he comes in and starts changing you at your pace with you and he does it in a very loving way what do you think Josh you ready come on up here come on up. if you guys want to come up and stand with him God bless you my brother yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We're going to see the greatest miracle of all right now. Just pray with me. I'm going to ask everybody to join me. Just make sure you pray out loud, Josh. Everybody's going to join in in support of you. Say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you now. And I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I need a Savior. I need forgiveness. I need a fresh start. A new beginning. I believe that you are Jesus. You are the Christ. The Son of the living God. 
I believe that you died for my sins and that you were buried and you rose again on the third day and that you're alive forevermore. And so I open my heart to you. I open my life up and I say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Change my life. Take up residence in me. And I promise, I'm going to do my best, Lord, to follow you. I'm going to read the Bible, talk to you in prayer, go to church, and let you grow in me. I am now a Christian, and I thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have a question for you. You meant that the best you knew how right now. Guess where Jesus is living right now? That's right, buddy. He's right in your heart. And there's a scripture. It says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's there permanently. Your journey has begun. Congratulations. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And uh, Susie has something for you. And uh, this is a brochure. I want you to read it. Yeah. Isn't it great? Everybody, I need, everybody should hug this guy before you get out of here, okay? I'm in the church, but uh, read that thing, buddy, okay? It'll help you get started. Amen, amen. All right, let's give the Lord a clap offering one more time. Thank God. Wow, praise God. Well, I think we had church today. That's good. All right, Jenny's got an announcement real quick she wants to make. Okay. Yes. I don't really need this mic, but, you know. Okay. <laughs> I got a big enough mouth. But anyways, um, first of all, I want to say happy Easter. Thank you all for coming out. Um, after church... We're going to do an Easter egg hunt for the kids that are in Sunday school class and for the little uh, nursery kids. Um, what I'm going to do is everybody needs to come outside with their children and just stand for like literally just a minute so we all get together. The nursery baby right here by the shed. You're right over here. And all the other children are going to be right where the swing set is and everything like that over there, okay? So um, we will meet you guys outside. And if that's it. Yeah. That's it. If there's nothing else, stand up, please. I'm going to give you the benediction this morning. God bless you. God be with you. You have a wonderful Easter. Enjoy your family. Remember how much he loves you. And you have now been benedicted. Is that a, that's not even a word, but... Uh, <laughs> make sure you hug at least five people. God bless you. You're dismissed today. Amen. Let's play a little music back there in the sound booth. Hey, Sophie, how you doing, sweetie? Good, Bye. how are you? God bless you, my darling. Aren't you happy? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Happy for your brother. And... Yes, I did.